Hello and welcome to whiskey.com where fine spirits meet. And today I'm in the highest town of Banffshire. Yeah, behind me you see a clock tower that is really famous. So the mold heads amongst you may have already found out where I am today. It's the wonderful town of Tomintau. We have a very nice museum here, very small and cozy about the surroundings and a bit about the heritage. Then we have the Whiskey Castle, a very interesting whiskey shop with a lot of whiskies from the area around here. Then we have a, a couple of hotels that are also really nice. And this town is actually about adventure. Yeah, you can have a lot of adventure here going into the nature, you can go biking. There are a lot of bike trails around here in the Glenlivet. Yeah, it's the Glenlivet estate around here. It's beautiful nature and it's a bit quiet around here in the season of fall. Yeah, if you go up six miles down or up the valley to the north, then you end up at a distillery and this is what it's all about today. So I'm a bit further in the valley and behind me you already see the green roofs of the distillery. Yeah, this is the Tom and Tao distillery. And let's go a bit deep into the history of the Tom and Tao distillery. It's not one of these very old distilleries. The company Tom and Tao distilling was founded in the 60s, in 1964 by two whiskey traders from Glasgow and they actually started building the uh, distillery in 65 and finished and produced whiskey and over the years during the 70s and the 80s the distillery was sold a couple of times last time it was sold it was in the year 2000 and it was sold from White & McKay to a company called Angus Dundee Angus Dundee is a company that is specializing in blends. So they trade a lot with India, they trade with Asia, and they do special blends. So they have their own blends, but they also do blends for other companies. So you can go up to the, the, uh, the company and say, we want to have a blend like that. And then they just work it out with you and uh, find the right uh, combination of malt and grain whiskey for you. So why did the Angus Dundee buy Tom and Tao? Tom and Tao has a, a very big output and also they have very, very good connections within the industry. So they can trade a lot of casks from different distilleries with spirit or older whiskey. Usually they trade with spirit. And uh, so they have a lot of stock on site they can choose from to make blends. So. That is a really big advantage, and that's why the youngest Dundee uh, bought the distillery of Tom and Tao. And they are pretty happy with it. And now up, um, now in, during the last years, the, the single malt whiskey is becoming a bit more uh, important. And more people realize that the, the single malt, the, the high premium whiskey is much better than you have uh, uh, from the blends, so the the brands of Tom and Tao, Tom and Tao, Ballon Druan, um, are becoming more important, which is very very nice for the distillery actually. Talking about Ballon Druan, why am I standing here in the the boggy hills of with a lot of heather, and mm, that's because I'm here at the foot of the hill where they collect their water. Ballon Druan is actually the name of the spring they use for their water. So about 200 yards from the distillery, there is a, a very wet and yeah, marshy trail to the actual spring, the Balantrua spring, where they collect the water and bring it to the distillery for the distilling. So yeah, that's one very, very important factor for the production. And now let's have a look what else happens inside the distillery. This here is an old portier malt mill from 1965, so pretty old, and it's running 
pretty much non-stop except once a year where it's been revised and everything is being adjusted. Yeah, it still runs in inches, but the people don't calculate in inches. They have their, their uh, Fehlerlehre and then they can adjust the, the distances. And when they get different molds that are bigger or smaller, they can just turn the dials a little bit and see if they are really uh, satisfied with the results. What is really interesting here at Tomantel is that they don't have one sort of mold. They have two sorts of molds. The regular mold is uh, being milled 41 weeks per year, so most of the time, and that is a normal unpeated mold. And then we do have five weeks during the year where the whole distillery smells a lot different because they use a peated malt. And when I say peated malt, I mean a heavily peated malt. They use 55 ppm, what they get from the big malting company. They don't do any special adjustments, so the peat levels vary a bit, but due to the sheer amount that they're producing here, it levels out to the 55 what they get from the uh, suppliers. So after it has been milled down to a coarse grist, it's going off to the mash tun. This here is the mash tun. It's a stainless steel mash tun. And stainless steel mash tuns have two important advantages. First of all, they're very, very easy to clean. There are not many substances that can be stuck there or, or be dirty there. And the second one is you have a, a very tight lid and that means there's little energy that can be escaping. So it's a very, very efficient process. What they do here is they have 12 tons of barley grist and they will, uh, it is being mixed with water and then filled into the mash tun and turned regularly. This dilutes the sugar and the starch inside the, the grist and the water receives it and then we call it mash. And this mash is really a very sugary, sweet, starchy liquid that is perfect for the alcoholic fermentation. The first mashing gives you about 48,000 liters of mash. The second one is done a bit differently. The water is being sprinkled on and that's why they call it a semi trun. And with this sprinkling, you can distribute the water very, very fine and very good. Then you rake it again and you end up with another 16,000 liters of mash that being sieved through the false floor and go off to the fermentation. There is another, a third step, a third mash, but you end up with a, a mash that is so low on, on uh, sugar and sweetness that the yeast couldn't use it for a good fermentation. So what they do is they store it in a separate tank and that water is then used in the next batch so everything is being conserved. We have six, six big stainless steel wash bags. They're being filled with 59,500 liters of mash and then they add yeast and the fermentation starts. This is the process where the actual alcohol is being produced. And they take the sugar with the yeast and they produce alcohol and CO2, which is then collected and being disposed. And here is where the distillery has to start to take care and really dig down and see how they want to create the flavor of the whiskey. Because the Tom and Tao has the slogan, the gentle dram. So they really have to look at what does a whiskey, what makes a whiskey a gentle whiskey. And they see it as it has a lot of nice fruity esters. And they're being produced by something called lactofermentation. During the first phase of uh, fermentation, like 32 hours-ish, you have the alcoholic fermentation, you end up with about 8% alcohol, and then the alcohol is done, kills the yeast, but then there is other bacteria that change the flavor of the, of the beer that is being produced. So they go up 
from 48 hours to about 60 hours of fermentation duration. And during that time, the, the flavor changes a bit, gets a bit more fruity and a bit more flowery. So this is what the gentle drum is the, in the first stage is all about. And here is where the magic happens. The shape of the stills at Chomantau are very, very important. That when you look at the wash still and the spirit still, they are roughly the same size and they are roughly the same shape. And that's because the people at the distillery who built the distillery were planning maybe to do a triple distillation. So they wanted to have one distill running twice and the other one running once. But yeah, it didn't quite work out. So their safety plan was to instill another still, to have three stills for the triple distillation. Yeah, didn't quite work out that well either. So what they did is, in the end, they were, worked with uh, double distillation. It still is a very gentle dram, as the slogan of the distillery is. And what they do to get this gentle dram is, they have a special shape for the dis, uh, still. The still is very, very tall for its size. It has about 20,000 liters of capacity, and the, the height is extraordinary for this size. And the second thing is they have a, a bulge or a reflux bowl. This, uh, for the first time, it makes a reflux, so the vapors can't just rise to the top very fast. They have a bit of a vortex going on, so there's more separation between um, going on with the alcohol. And then you have more surface volume. And the surface volume is very, very important because the copper does a catalytic reaction and takes out all the unwanted, sharp, not so nice flavors. And what you are left off is what we get from the fermentation. The fruitiness, the floralness, the esters. And that is what makes the Tom and Tao a fruity, nice, gentle drum. So this is the warehouse of Tom and Tao. Most of the spirit is matured in ex-bourbon casks, but they now get into these cask finishes, or even already gotten into these cask finishes, with Oloroso, other sherries, or port wine cask. Some of them even are single cask bottlings that they have in their range now. But what I told at the beginning is that they were and still are in the blend industry. So they have very, very good connections to other distilleries. And then they exchange cask with each other. So there are a lot of casks from different distilleries that have other styles. What uh, Tom and Tao can't reach because they have focused solely on uh, the gentle dram. So there is uh, some smokier stuff that is commonly traded. Um, and also I found some quite interesting gems here that I really wouldn't have expected here at this warehouse. So I don't think that few of these casks are still known to be here from these distilleries, but they are really interesting barrels here. But let's get back to the uh, Tom and Tell single malt. We're gonna have a little interview and a few questions answered from their distillery director. So I'm sitting here with Robert Fleming. You are now 45 years in the business. Correct. Uh, 29 years at uh, Tom and Tao. Yep. And you are the director at Angus Dundee. Mm -hmm. And you're also a bit of a uh, director here at the distillery and master distiller. Absolutely. So thank you very much for having us. Thank you for showing us around and showing us the whole distillery. So you are actually a local here. So how is it to live at, at Tom and Tao or around here? Well, I, I was actually born and brought up only six miles away, down in uh, oh, Glenlivet. That's, that's cool. Um, and I grew up at the distillery at Glenlivet because my father, my grandfather and great-grandfather all worked at the Glenlivet. <laughs> so I, I grew up from, I, I used to go down to the distillery at a very young age. And my dad would take <laughs> me down and um, I used to go into the old malt barns and uh, watch how they, 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 they produced the malted barley. And, it was an amazing childhood, amazing growing up in the in this area. The, you are a bit remote, mm -hmm. but 
I think that there are a lot more plus points than there are minuses for growing up in an area such as this. Yeah, it's, it's a lovely area. You have such a beautiful surrounding. It I've is. seen a bit with the with the hills and a bit of the the, the boggy terrain. Mm, and oh yeah. Sometimes we don't appreciate what we have in our own doorstep. Yeah, yeah. I live in a nice area as well, so... <laughs> okay. So, uh, we're trying a few of your expressions today. Mm -hmm. So, what are we having today? Today, we're going to start off with our flagship single malt, which is the Tom and Tell 16-year-old. Mm -hmm. And then, as a total contrast, we're going to give you a taste of our Old Ballantruin, uh, which is our peated expression we make at Tom and Tell. Oh, very nice, very nice. So I'm, I'm really excited about how, how to see when, when you have that uh, fermentation and the, the, the tall pot stills that all is going towards the gentle dram. So I'm, I'm really excited about how gentle the dram is going to be. I, I'm <laughs> sure you'll find it very gentle. Um, would you like to have a, have a taste? Yeah. That would be nice. You don't mind if I join you? Oh uh, yeah, sure, sure. I, I would be delighted. Tom and Tao, the gentle dram. I like that. It's really nice, though. So it's it's amazing how how uh, how how far away you are when you when you're just one valley over. I mean, okay, Dufftown is not not a big city either, but no, no, it's not far away. <laughs> but we're, Tom and Tao is actually within the Glenlivet estate. Mm -hmm. And within the Glenlivet estate, there's only four distilleries, mm -hmm. uh, and the Glenlivet being one of them. So we're quite uh, privileged that uh, when they decided to build the distillery here in 1965, mm -hmm. they chose an area, albeit they chose it for the water supply from the Ballantruin Spring, but they chose the area because this was synonymous with uh, high-quality whiskies. Mm. So the gentle dram... Um, during the production process, a lot of the flavors are generated within the fermentation process. Mm -hmm. However, if you go into our still house, you will see our copper pot stills are quite large, very mm -hmm. tall. The, the lye pipe, which is the pipe from the top of the still to the condenser, mm -hmm. is basically horizontal. Mm -hmm. And we've got, we've got condensers and we have uh, subcoolers as well. Now, when you're distilling the spirit, we can't really call it whiskey until it's three years old, but when we're distilling the spirit, the more contact with copper, mm -hmm. the lighter the spirit. So what you get in the new spirit is very light, fruity, estuary notes. And these are carried on into the matured whiskey. Mm -hmm. Although in the matured whiskey, there's a lot more complexities Mm. Uh, that come out of the of the wood, whether it's from a first fill bourbon or a second fill or a third fill or a sherry cask. So the initial stages of making the spirit, the lightness, the fruitiness, all carries forward into the matured whiskey. Mm -hmm. So what are we looking at here? Is it a bourbon uh, maturation? There's, a, there's a, a lot of uh, uh, bourbon casks in here, whether it's first fill bourbon, second fill, third fill, mm -hmm. and some hogsheads as well. Uh, there's no sherry wood in the 16-year-old. In the mm, okay. So, but mainly, mainly bourbon casks. Now, the, the, on the nose, when you get that sort of uh, the vanilla notes and the sweetness, they're coming from the, from the cask. Mm-hmm. If you get vanilla coming through, that's mainly from the first fill bourbon. Any of the other sweetnesses come from the the the, the, the mix of all the different uh, different casks. Mm -hmm. Now, when you taste, you'll notice we haven't added water. Mm -hmm. So, Tomatel was quite easy to drink without. Um, without mm. adding water mm. some people and again i would mm. recommend that you add a little spot of water to it water tends to let the flavors go grow within the the, 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 the whiskey however um it's such a gentle dram as we as a, state I, I on want the to label. say that it's a, it's, it's such a, a gentle dram. it's a gentle dram 
that uh, you can drink it without without uh, adding water. Or if you want to add water to it, just add a little mm -hmm. a little spot. Mm. Mm. It's There's really it's really I don't want to say creamy, but it's it's uh, mild. I would say it is Gentle, very mild and very mild. Uh, a good amount of fruitiness. And yeah, a bit of a bourbon character. You can certainly detect the, the, the bourbon notes coming off because of the vanilla and the and the sweetness. Mm -hmm. So where's the water from that I'm getting here? The the water that you're, you'll never get this anywhere else. <laughs> this is this is unique. The water you're going to add to it is the same water from the Ballantruan spring that we make the whiskey with. So it's the Ballantruan. <laughs> Ballantruan spring. So um, you can only get, uh, unless you... you uh, bottle that uh, sample you'll never get uh, to taste the tom and towel with the the, the the water it's made with so the, the water doesn't go to any springs or anything it comes from a spring um it just bubbles up through the ground through the spring collected into a, a holding tank and then straight into the into the production mm -hmm. No Highland Springs or any other. We, we don't. <laughs> we don't. We don't bottle the water. Man, that, there's an idea. We might. Uh, we might have to have to think about bottling the water. Mm. 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 You can also know oh, what we're doing fruity. with the glass. Look how long the legs are within the within the glass. This will take a long time for the the teardrops to mm -hmm. to uh, come down to the bottom. Mm -hmm. But yeah, very. Very mild, mellow, easy drinking. Mm -hmm. If it was going to be a, a beginner's single malt, 10-year-old would be the beginner's single malt. 16-year-old mm -hmm. should be the beginner's single malt. <laughs> so um, you're, you're not just within the single malt industry or business, I would say, want to say. So I've seen... A few casks in your in your warehouse from other distilleries, yep. so there are, there is good amount of cask exchange going on. So um, how is that cask exchange going on, and how did it change over the years? I mean, you started in seventy four. Seventy four. Did did it change over the time? Oh, absolutely. The the when I started in the industry, mm -hmm. the nearly every distillery that produced a single malt was only one expression of single malt. The majority of the whiskies in the 1950s up to about the early 1970s went for blending. Mm -hmm. it, the phenomenon of single malts probably kicked off in the early to mid 1960s, mm -hmm. um, but again, only maybe with one expression for each distillery. Mm -hmm. Over the years, um, again, due to um, the different markets that they, they were, were into, the industry have tried to address what each market, the expressions that they want, whether it's the, the different ages from 10 year old, 16, 21, 25, or do they want uh, sherry finishes? Do they want port finishes, wine finishes? There's a lot of, of different um, offerings or expressions that we can, we can supply to the, to the marketplace. And we're not alone in this. Other companies do the same. So instead of just producing one expression, 16-year-old Tomatel, we now produce a lot of different uh, ages and mm -hmm. finishes. The company, we are still predominantly a blending company. That's mm -hmm. how the company started, as a blending company. But over the years, we've seen that, the, although we still are a blending company, over the years, we've seen that the interest in whiskies worldwide People go from drinking blends and they will progress to drinking single malts. Mm -hmm. So there'll be a progression. It doesn't mean to say that blends will disappear. Blends will still be the backbone of the industry. But mm -hmm. single malts are a growing market. Mm -hmm. And if you travel, I've been to many, many countries of the world. If you travel to the Far East, you go to South Africa, you go to uh, the US, uh, it's mainly the single malts that are the growth market. Mm -hmm. So, um, but uh, is it is it still possible to to exchange casks with other oh, distilleries? Absolutely. To, mm -hmm. to, to as a, as a as a company, we own two distilleries. Mm -hmm. In the blends that we create, 
because we, we do, we create bespoke blends for a number of different customers. The blends that we create might have 10, 15, 20 different malt whiskies. Mm-hmm. So the only way that we can um, acquire those whiskies is to exchange with other, other companies. Now, we usually exchange at new spirit stage. Mm-hmm. So a lot of the, the, the companies, and I'm talking here about the, the biggest companies in the, in the industry, mm-hmm. They want our Tomatel spirit because it is very light, fruity, and estuary, mm-hmm. which is ideal for their blends. Mm-hmm. So in some of the more famous blends in, in, the, in the industry, there could be some Tomatel. We don't know. Because <laughs> when, we, when we exchange with these guys, they don't tell us what they're using our Tomatel spirit for, mm-hmm. and we don't tell them <laughs> what I'm using uh, their spirit for. So it's what they call reciprocal uh, exchanges, and because um, they need my spirit for their blends, obviously to mature into mm-hmm. their blends and I need their spirits for for my blends. Okay. So um but you're not doing just the the normal version now. So old Balantruan mm. is is a peaty whiskey. Yeah. So uh how, when did you start with the peaty? We started uh, the Angus Dundee took over Tom and Tell in um, year two thousand. Mm-hmm. And because they were a blending company, the first thing they wanted to do was uh, create bespoke blends and give them the, the, the customers the opportunity to add peated whiskies to the blends. Now, rather than go out to the, the, the companies who were traditionally making peated whiskies, I was asked by our chairman, can we make a peated spirit, peated whiskey? Mm-hmm. So in 2001... I started, uh, we, we take in the malted barley already peated. It's heavily peated. It's 55 mm-hmm. ppm as a spec. It's heavily peated malted barley. We don't change anything in the process. Mm-hmm. The malted barley is where the, the peatiness comes from. So we started doing this in 2001. A few years later, when we were sampling the, the, the whiskies ready for the blends, we found that the single malt, which obviously we produce, could stand in its own right as a, mm-hmm. as a single. So we decided to take out the old Ballantruan. So not only do we add it to our bespoke blends, we also took it out as a single malt. I like it, so let's try it. Like, yeah. Once I can open it. Mm-hmm. Now, this is so different from the 16-year-old. What you'll find in this one is that the... You'll get the peaty notes coming through immediately. Mm -hmm. Even just taking your nose into the glass, you'll pick up that phenolic, that... Uh, sort of uh, burnt wood type um, type nose. It's not until you taste it that you find that it doesn't appear as peaty or phenolic or smoky or medicinal as some of the traditional peated whiskies, especially from the island of Isla. Mm-hmm. One of the key aspects of that is the actual peat that they're using to to make the malted barley with. Mm-hmm. The peat that's cut in the island of Islay has had <coughs> hundreds of thousands of years of salt spray coming onto the onto the island. So that goes into the ground. Mm-hmm. Whereas the peat from Tom and Tow, which is only six miles from here, or from mainland Scotland, is mainly is mainly made up of dead trees, vegetation, mm-hmm. whatever. So the peat is actually plays a big part in the in the nose that you you find in the finished product. Certainly, on the on the nose, it's very it's burnt wood, not no medicinal notes coming through, no iodine. Yeah, it's very it's, very it's different to a, to a island or Absolutely. an island malt, and it's a bit of sweetness to it as well. And mm-hmm. go back to my sixteen year old. Mm-hmm. I don't change anything in production, so we're only taking over the lighter elements over the still first. So mm-hmm. you're getting that light notes coming through in the spirit, 
Again, we mature it in bourbon casks and, and, and hogsheads as well. Um, we don't mature it in first fill bourbon. So you won't get that vanilla notes coming through as you would in the 16 year old, but you're still getting the lighter elements of the, of the tomatel mm -hmm. production. Oh, I love it. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's a bit, it's a bit stronger. It's higher strength than the 16 year old. Mm -hmm. But the aftertaste is much, much longer. You will taste this for hours. It'll be in your mouth for hours. Mm. You don't you don't write it with the gentle dram on it, the, right? Well, no, not in this one. We have another expression called the PT Tang, which <laughs> does say the gentle dram, but um, no, the, the, the gentle dram is mainly for the, 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 the normal unpeated versions. But... Um, Peated whiskies are an acquired taste for me, mm -hmm. but this this I can live with because it doesn't have that mm. medicinal notes that are coming mm. through. But the aftertaste is phenomenal. It has a certain roundness to it, mm. but yet it's uh, I don't want to say rough and tough. It, it it's uh, it's exciting. Let's say that way. Um, it has to have a good amount of peatiness. It has some kick to it, but it's um, it's round. For, for it's, I don't want to say gentle, but no, it, I, it I, I, I wouldn't say gentle either. <laughs> but again, if you were, um, it's it's got an acquired taste. Okay, you're not allowed to smoke in, in bars or uh, hotels anymore. Mm -hmm. But as an after dinner drink, um, in the evening, this is ideal. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's. Uh, I used to do a lot of whiskey tastings, um, pairing it with food, and you would start off with the the lighter, fruitier Tom and Tells, then you would end up with the with the Old Ballantruin, and the the as a as a an after dinner drink, it is ideal. Mm -hmm. So, so you said the story behind that was that you you actually wanted to have it as an ingredient for your blends, but now it comes out as a single malt. And Absolutely, it's, it's amazing. And uh, you've seen the, the market change from the 70s to what we have now. Um, what do you think will happen in the future? Will we, will we see even a more rise to the single malt? Will the blends come back? What do you think? Uh, okay, if I can take out my crystal ball here. <laughs> just will have the crystal ball in front. Um, good question. The, I think the, the single malt, the more that the industry evolves, the more that people go out and spread the word about Scotch whiskey, the more the people that drink Scotch whiskey understand and know more about the, the single malts and the and obviously blends as well, they always want to explore something new. So whether it's a sherry finish or a port finish or a wine finish, they always want to try something different. And I can see that the single malt market will um, increase the blended market will, I'm not saying decline, because the blended market will hopefully increase as well, mm -hmm. uh, because that's the backbone of the industry, as I mentioned earlier. But I can see the single malt market in certain in countries, because there's a lot of countries out there that, the, um, you know, that, that haven't been introduced to single malts. They can understand mm -hmm. blends, but the single malts haven't been sort of promoted in those countries. And that's why... We have uh, people like myself that can go across to the, the, the various countries mm -hmm. and uh, spread the word on single malts. Uh, we have lots of companies now have uh, brand ambassadors. Mm -hmm. uh, brand ambassadors go out, travel the world, mm -hmm. uh, you know, extolling the virtues of uh, whether it's the, the single malts or the peated single malts. So, yeah, there's going to be, there's certainly going to be a place for the blends. But I think the single malt market will, will certainly increase. Mm -hmm. So you think that these, um, let's say, developing or uh, what do you second world countries or uh, the the one that not developing what what do you the the in betweens? So they you think they will ha see the same thing happening? What what happened in here in the nineties? Yeah, I I can see. For example, the the ten years ago there was the what they called the BRIC countries. Yeah, BRIC well, countries. The, Brazil, Russia, India, and China. Mm -hmm. 
We have an office in China, we have an office in India, and mm -hmm. we have an office in Thailand that covers the ASEAN countries. Mm -hmm. So we are, we, as a company, we are concentrating on those on those markets. India is mainly for the blended whiskies. Mm -hmm. China uh, is a, again a, a, a really strong growth market uh, that we're hoping mm -hmm. is going to grow mm -hmm. for the single malts. But India is already pretty introduced to Scotch whisky due to the. You know, the whole British Empire thing? They are, but not so much on the single malts. It's mainly mm -hmm. blended whiskies. Mainly yeah. blended, mm -hmm. okay. Okay, very, very much uh, Very much. thank you for, for that insight. Uh, it's rarely to have someone who is who's, uh, uh, that into the business. So, uh, yeah, thank you very much for having us here. No, it's a thank pleasure. Thank you very much for the tasting here. And, um, yeah, thank you very much for watching this video. If you like this video, then please give a thumbs up. Uh, or if you know anybody who might be interested, then feel free to share this video with your friends. Uh, yeah, thank you and see you next time.